Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of the Block Thrasher Daily Crypto Update, where we are shattering the complexities of crypto with news, commentary, analysis, and education. I am recording this for the second time because about halfway through, my software crashed. Man, I, I have a pretty decent Mac, but and it's not very old, but I might have to upgrade to a more powerful system because I am just having some technical difficulties. Anyway... It is a great, great day for crypto. It's Monday, June 14th, 1043. Yes, I'm recording this late and I apologize for that, but I have had so many technical difficulties this morning with my system and everything else that I am just running behind. But hey, it is a great day for crypto. We've got some really good things to talk about. I am excited. And right now the market is teaching us a huge lesson, which I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about. It's a big picture concept. I think you're going to enjoy it. There's also a lot of good news. So hang tight. Now, every single day I create podcasts and videos to help you understand cryptocurrency better. I get up early, I work super hard, and I do a ton of analysis on what's going on with the current crypto space. And the, and the daily crypto update is more about covering the news. And then there's other uh, mediums through which I'm going to provide more education. Now, if you haven't, please go visit blockthrasher.com, sign up for a new account. And that is going to be the place where I'm going to be providing more written content with deeper analysis. There's also a newsletter there. If you sign up for an account on blockthrasher.com, you're automatically entered in as a newsletter subscriber. And you will, if you buy a paid, paid subscription for $5 a month, you will be a paid member and you will get access to the paid membership content. Now, I would absolutely love to get some of your support. I spend hours and hours and hours every day studying cryptocurrency, looking at the news to bring you the best possible information I can. However, there's a lot of content that I've been working on, some like a deep dive into Polkadot and you know the Cardano ecosystem, and a lot of things that I just can't get to you because of time limits. And the more of you that support what I'm doing, the better information I can bring to you and the more time that I can spend doing that. So I would really appreciate your support. Of course, no obligation. I mean, I'm happy to just have you as part of the audience and to listen every single day and to tune in. But if you would consider doing that, it can help me up my game and bring you better quality content, better information about what's going on in the cryptocurrency space and cryptos to be aware of and to watch for and better analysis. I can go deeper into the projects in the type of analysis that I do and the fundamental analysis, right? So please consider that. Go to blockcrasher.com. At least sign up for a free membership. And if you'd like to support what's going on here in the channel, what I'm doing with Block Thrasher, and maybe just grab a $5 membership or, or do a year. A lot of people just bought a year membership, which, which is really helpful. And I do appreciate that. And before we jump into the market real quickly here, uh, I heard this story and it made me laugh. And I thought you might find it funny as well. So a daughter uh, shows her banker father her work on the Bitcoin Lightning Network to speed up trans transactions. Apparently she's a developer. And in response, her, her father, being a banker as he is, says, would you like to hear my opinion of Bitcoin? And she says, okay, sure. And he says, well, it's worthless. And she says, yeah, I know it's worthless, but I'd like to hear it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> ah, props to the daughter. Yeah. Quick there on the reply. Hey, let's jump into the word of the day. Right now, the actually before we do that, the total market is uh, actually doing what our word of the day is. It's just billowing up at the moment. You know, it, it's interesting. And, and, and what's happening right now is just teaching all of us, I think, that cryptocurrency, the cryptocurrency market <laughs> is going to do what the cryptocurrency market is going to do. It is completely unpredictable. And anybody who says this is kind of the general axiom, and I'm going to dive deeper into this and illustrate what I'm talking about more, but the general axiom is you cannot predict this market. You can try, and there's different methods that you might apply in order to do that. And people all over the place are going to make these predictions, and they're going to say this, and they're going to say that, based on this and based off of that, and crypto's just going to come and just slap them in the face and say, mm -mm, no, guess what? I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I have a mind of my own, and you're, <laughs> you're going to look stupid make your predictions look stupid. And that's exactly what happens. Anyway, it is billowing up. Billow to swell out, puff up, etc. as by the action of wind. Billow is the word of the day. B-I-L-L-O-W. Not that uncommon of a word, I don't think. So look at this market. Wow, this is crazy. So what was happening this week was, and this is, what happened this week was 
not typical. And so I think it threw a lot of people for a loop. Anybody that was trying to day trade or like I say, make these predictions on the market, uh, it's kind of sitting here going like, oops, <laughs> got that wrong. And so, so many people that were posting their charts up and their technical analysis had just been destroyed by what's going on in the market today and yesterday. Total market cap is up 10.9% to 1.7 trillion. We've been hovering around 1.5, touching 1.6 the last week or two. And uh, now suddenly, boom, we've got this this little bounce, this increase, and we're at $1.73 trillion. That's looking good. Bitcoin dominance is also up a little bit, 43.9%, uh, and ETH is at 17.3%. Gas prices are starting to climb. Just an hour ago, when I first started recording <laughs> the first time, uh, the standard was 20 Gwei, and now it's 30 Gwei. So we're seeing a lot of trading activity going on on the Ethereum network, obviously, and probably on DeFi as well. Now, when it comes to price, Bitcoin is actually outperforming the market this week in the last seven days. It is the only crypto that is up, and it's up 13.4%. Everything else is down on the week. However, in the last 24 hours, everything else is following Bitcoin. Bitcoin currently up 7.2% to $40,254. So Bitcoin broke through that $40,000 barrier. And here's what I'm talking about. It's interesting is, you know, a lot of people were making proclamations that Bitcoin's going to drop down to 29 or 20,000 or and we've got this double cross bearish signal coming from the, the technical analysis people were saying look you know the the market was was dropping on Tuesday i think we were down 10% probably on bitcoin or something something, something near there and so everybody was saying wow look look at this chart look at look at watch out for the bloodbath that is coming this weekend because tr traditionally speaking Usually, that's what happens is Saturday, Sunday, Monday, the market sees its low. And so that's one of the best times, historically speaking, to buy. It'll dip during that time of the week. This week, not the case. We started to see the market turn up on Sunday, and that's continuing into today on Monday. And so all of these people were just completely wrecked in their analysis, right? And, and that's one of the things I want to talk about is this concept of technical analysis and this axiom that I have held for a long time. And I think it's proven to be true over and over and over again. And I'll share that here with you just in a moment. But first, let's wrap up market the market and see what's going on with prices. So Ethereum is up also 6% to $2,566. Uh, BNB, 7.3% increase to $368.88. Cardano up 6.6% to $1.56. Dogecoin up 3% to $0.32. Cents. XRP up 6.5% to $0.90. Cents. Polkadot up 9.8% to $23.04. Uniswap up 9% to $23.71. Bitcoin Cash is up 6%, $621. Litecoin up 5.3% to $174.56. Solana up 8.6% to $39.38. And Chainlink up 13.3%. To 24. Polygon is up 9.9% to $1.52. And that wraps up the top 15. As we can see, everything is moving with Bitcoin. Everything is up six, seven, eight. It's been up, you know, depending on when you check uh, CoinGecko or CoinMarketCap, around somewhere between five and 10% is what we're seeing happen at this moment. But the market is moving fast. And of late, it's been a roller coaster. It's been up, it's been down, it's been up, it's been down. And, and overall, I think where we're at right now is actually very good and, and encouraging and promising. We're just moving sideways. Yes, we've had some 10% or higher, 10, 15% up, down, up, down. But overall, if we can make it through the summer months without seeing a serious, serious or significant crash, and some people might argue, well, Bitcoin's down at 40 and it was at 60. So that's a pretty serious crash. Eh, not really. A serious crash would be like back down to 10 or something in that range or 20 even. Uh, and, and it may take that. I mean, a lot of times with market cycles, you do have to come to the point where everybody's sort of in despair and everybody's just sort of walking away and all the retail, it's, it's a shakeout is what happens. Shakeout of retail investors where they just give up and they walk away and then the whales come back in and they just buy up more and they wait for the next cycle to take advantage of the retail investors. But a couple of things are going on, I think, that might prevent that from happening this time. And number one is we've got these, and we'll see stories today that would would argue this point. We've got these institutional investors coming in and they're just continuing to buy 
crap out of Bitcoin, out of cryptocurrency. So that's keeping what would normally happen from happening. And I think we have a maturing market where we've got a lot more retail investors that are becoming a little bit more savvy and are recognizing that they just want to hold, right? And so they're, they're having a little bit of a different perspective where they're becoming investors instead of the short time day trader type of maybe hopefully, hopefully they're buying into the ideologies behind cryptocurrency, which whenever people do that, they end up becoming longer term holders, right? But the other thing that's going on, actually, there'd be a third thing in the global picture is everybody knows that we are in a crazy time of Federal Reserve spending and an increase in the monetary supply. And we're, we're, we're running up against inflation. And there's a lot of news coming out about that and stories and, and another a significant figure, Paul Tudor Jones, we'll talk about it here in a bit, who is talking about that. And he's a guy from the old camp. He's a guy from the old guard, right? As so many of them were that are starting to capitulate, starting to wake up, if you will, to the realities of what's happening, right? They're defend they were defenders even of the traditional space of the monetary system of the Federal Reserve. But they're starting to say, look, we <laughs> what's going on is 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 new territory and it's kind of scary. And so they're looking to crypto and turning into crypto. All right. So here we go. Before we jump into the news of the day, I'm going to talk about this axiom that I have been arguing for and that I hold and that I think this current market situation illustrates and it gets illustrated over and over again. But right now is, is one of those times where it's being illustrated really, really, really well. And my axiom is that you cannot apply traditional technical analysis to the cryptocurrency space well. And it's even questionable whether it works really well in traditional markets. But just in case you don't know, I try, let me just put some background information to make this as simple because that's my job here is to make everything as simple as possible for you. And I don't know where you're coming from. Some of you in the audience are probably, you know, well beyond needing a basic explanation, but many are not. So in an effort to help you guys, this is what I'm going to do. With Traditionally, there's two, two I mean, there's probably more, but two primary methods of investing and doing analysis on assets and or on investments. And in, in, in traditionally, I'm talking about like equities in the stock market, that sort of thing. There's technical analysis and then there's fundamental analysis. What, what are those and how are they different? Well, technical analysis, it tries to be uh, mathematical and it's, it's, it's really based on chart reading, right? And there's all these different kinds of complicated ways to analyze what's going on in the market in terms of charts and a price movement, right? And so you'll have stochastics and you have Ichimoto moto clouds and you'll have RSA and the moving averages and the MACDs and all kinds of things, right? And then there's all these patterns that you can see on a chart. And you know, lately people have been saying, oh, we've got this, uh, what are they calling it? This bear trap or bull trap because we've got this double, I'm blanking on the word right now, but it's like this double head, whatever kind of thing, right? And so they'll come out and say, because of this, Bitcoin's going to do that. And so what's, what's what's interesting about it is they just get destroyed over and over again, right? And they get wrecked. Right now, many of the technical analysis people were calling for Bitcoin to drop down to 29,000 or lower, maybe even 20,000. And so, you know, it's interesting though. If you pay attention closely, it's always, if this happens, then that will happen. And if this happens, then that will happen. It's never, this has happened. Therefore that is going to happen. So, Ultimately, here's the reason why this is not really, really effective. And I know I'm going to upset some people out there who are big believers, you know, and I think it's there's a level of hubris, though, in it is because you think you become smart enough to predict the market, you know, which is this this market is too wild. This market is like a raging. Uh, what would you call it? like a wild Mustang. Okay. I'd compare it that way. The traditional stock market is like a, is a, it's like a well-trained horse, right? Where you have tons of institutional investors who are applying the same kind of technical analysis. And so they all move in the same way and it ends up working. And they're like, Oh, look, you know, our prediction became, well, the cryptocurrency is not like that. It's too small. Number one, too small for that type of analysis. Number two, it's too easily moved by whales. Number three, it's too easily moved by significant personalities and institutions. Right now, we're going to look at a news story today that illustrates what I'm talking about. You have MicroStrategy coming in and buying a ton, right? And then what happens with Grayscale Fund has a major in influence. And then somebody like, you know, uh, 
uh, um, Elon Musk will come out and say something or some governmental agency or some regulator or whatever system and scares the crap out of everybody or something from China happens. And all your technical analysis is just destroyed by the effect that that particular news item has on market sentiment or the way that people feel. And there's all kinds of other things going on in the big macro picture as well, like stimulus money being printed and sent out to people that they're then investing in the market. So anyway, point being is the cryptocurrency market is, is only 1.73 trillion, which is tiny, 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 tiny relative to other markets, relative to the traditional markets, right? I mean, you'll have companies, we still have companies like Apple that are valued at more than the entire cryptocurrency space. So that's a big reason for it. Now, I didn't finish my explanation of the difference between technical analysis and fundamental analysis. Fundamental analysis looks at a company, right? And so one of the, if you look at, if you read and start learning about investing, you, you read Benjamin Graham or you read about Warren Buffett or whatever, these guys, these value investors, uh, Warren Buffett, for instance, once when asked about technical analysis, said, I don't use it and it's garbage. It's worthless to me. And he said, if you take a chart and you flip it upside down, it looks exactly the same to me. So he's never relied upon that. He uses fundamental analysis. So fundamental analysis is looking at the company and looking at factors of the company, such as who, what is the team? Who are they made of? What is their background? What is their track record? What skills do they have? What knowledge do they have? What abilities do they have? Do they have a good team? And then, and then diving deeper into what is their business model? Who are their competitors? How much market share can, can they capture, right? Go and visit the facility. Are they implementing new technology? What are they doing? What is their, you know, and then you look at other factors like the profit and loss statement or the P&E ratio and all these other types of things that are just looking at the fundamentals of that company. And then if you understand, and then, and then if you can understand that well, making a making a a prediction based upon that analysis rather than on just a chart or whatever right so the same can be done with cryptocurrency some people will come along and then like tone vase if you want to follow a guy that is one of the better known guys that's doing technical analysis go follow his youtube channel and he'll be right half the time or less right and, and you can apply that that those charting techniques to cryptocurrency and you can end up getting wrecked is what often happens or you can apply fundamental analysis where you say, okay, what is the team like? Do they have a good team? Or is it a legitimate team that's that's known, that has the skills? That's why some of the, look at the projects that are that are in the top 10 and you've got people, Ethereum, Vitalik Buterin, right? Hitting that off. Cardano, former Ethereum founder, Charles Hoskinson, hitting that off, right? Polkadot, Gavin Woods, former Ethereum founder as well. All these guys... Many of them have doctorates. They're doctors within the within the either either in mathematics or cryptography or whatever. Algorand would be another example. You go down the list. Uh, obviously, Bitcoin having a this core development team, and, and so many of these others. So you can analyze the team. What is the team like? Is there a a foundation behind it, or a company like IOHK or Gavin Wood's company, which is which is which is called uh, not Solidity? Solidity is the programming language. Uh, substrate? No, it's not substrate. What is this company called? Blinking on it right now. But anyway, there's these. They have good teams, right? so you you analyze that, and then you look at the coin metrics. What is the total supply? What is the maximum supply going to be? Is it inflationary? Is it hyperinflationary? Does it have a maximum supply? And you analyze that, and you look at the market cap. And, and a really great way to do some analysis is that, so you have a competitor to Ethereum. Let's just say Ethereum being number two, and Ethereum has a total market cap relation like cap market cap right now. Of, about $300 trillion. Well, what happens if Cardano, as one of its top competitors, or Polkadot, matches its market cap? It gives you a good indication of where Cardano could potentially go. Right now, Cardano is $1.57. If Cardano were to match Ethereum's market cap, it'd be about $8, $8, $9, 10 somewhere in there. So that gives you an idea of where it could potentially go. So you look at the team, you look at the metric, the coin metrics or the coin economics and the, the numbers, and you can find that information out at coingecko.com or coin market cap or many any a number of other places uh, and and so then you look at their marketing ability do they have a foundation do they have money do they have a way and the ability to bring on new products look at the ecosystem are there a lot of people that are planning to or are developing on that ecosystem and then you look at the technology is it better technology 
Is there transactions per second faster? Is their ability to scale faster? Is their interoperability faster? Are they going to be able to send their crypto cross chain to other chains and that sort of thing? Or will there be methods for doing that? Are they going to be able to implement dApps? Well, will those dApps be able to scale? Will they run fast and efficiently and be cost effective? Right? Will there be DeFi on it? Will there be NFTs? All these types of things. That's all fundamental analysis that you can look at and zoom back, get the bigger picture uh, view of whether this is a project that's going to down the road, continue to grow and potentially even dominate. And you make your decisions based upon that, right? But here, so, so here's the general axiom that I, I've been arguing for for a long, long time is that you cannot apply technical analysis to this market because it's too small, it's too new, and it's too easily moved by outside influences and events, whether it be an individual like Mark Cuban or Elon Musk making a statement, whether it be something that's going on with a government regulatory agency, whether it be whatever it is, right? It's just not at that point now. Maybe someday, maybe someday, but even then I'm a little bit speculative of that. All right, that's enough on that. So, so ultimately what that end, ends up being is the, the investing strategy that I advocate for is do your research dig deep into the project, find out as much as you possibly can about all of those things I was talking about, the team and the technology and the community. What's the community like? Because at the end of the day, you need all of those factors, but you also need adoption. It doesn't matter if you have the best technology. It doesn't matter if you have the best team. You could be a really phenomenal crypto project. If you don't have the marketing ability to get people on board using the platform, it doesn't grow, it doesn't expand, it doesn't increase in value. Value is derived by demand. Demand is derived by adoption and growth of the community. The more people that use that particular crypto, the more value it, value it holds. And so it's really exciting to see some of these, which, you know, and I think it's a good strategy. They're going into even third countries around the world. And, and there's a new story that I think we'll see today that illustrates what I'm talking about here where adoption is actually growing in places like Africa and Asia faster than it's growing here in the United States. And the projects that capture that, to me, are worth investing in because they're growing a user base. Now, someone might say, well, they barely have any money in those countries. Well, maybe that's the case for now, but that can also change. But it's, 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 it's adoption, it's community, it's usage. And at the end of the day, that's going to bring value. You know, you look at traditional businesses, you know, Starbucks, for instance, Starbucks has super high prices, but what made them profitable was the volume. They just get a ton of people going through that drive through and buying. McDonald's, same thing, right? And that's what crypto needs as well. It needs that volume. So there you go. Big picture overview. Axiom I want to talk about. Truth. Let's look at today's news stories and see what's going on in the cryptocurrency space of now. All right. And this illustrates what I was talking about. Remember what I was saying? You know, you could have all the charts are telling you that the market's going to die. The price of Bitcoin is going down and the rest of the market with it. That's what your technical analysis is telling you. Maybe even you feel like you're looking at the sentiment of the cryptocurrency space and you see the way people are responding and you're in all the forums and in all the groups and you see people like panicking and like, ah, and then you have Bitcoin's biggest backer. This is a story from Forbes. It's interesting. Forbes is becoming one of the better crypto news sources. But anyway, the biggest Bitcoin backer raises $500 million to buy more, topping expectations as crypto surges. And we see this happening over and over again. Every time MicroStrategy comes out and does another round of fundraising to buy more Bitcoin, they exceed expectations of how much money they're going to raise. Less than a week after announcing the offering, business analytics firm MicroStrategy, which owns more Bitcoin than any other corporation in the world, has raised $500 million in bonds to acquire more of the world's largest cryptocurrency, signaling institutional investors are still optimistic about the token's future as it pairs back losses from a crash last month. Of course they are. If you go and listen to Michael Saylor and the other institutionals that are buying in, they have fundamental reasons for doing what they're doing. These guys are not day traders. These guys are not, excuse me for a second while I grab a sip. You're a Dogecoin, uh, uh, you know, come rocket, save me, whatever. Uh, I'm going to throw a couple hundred bucks in and hope I make a thousand bucks and, you know, 
be think I'm this uh, hot hot stuff day trader. These guys understand what's going on globally and with the monetary systems and with the central banks and the Federal Reserve. They understand the impl implications and ramifications of all of this stimulus that's going on and the geopolitics of all everything. And so they're hedging against that. And so their ideology hasn't changed. They're not going to pull out and dump. They're going to keep buying, buying, buying more. And they they have a guy like Michael Saylor, Michael Strategy, he also has an agenda. He wants to, he's basically shorting the dollar right now is what he's doing through Bitcoin. And he wants to see because of his ideology, because of his belief system, which is freedom. He wants to see freedom. He wants freedom based. He wants people to be able to actually build wealth and protect their wealth rather than having it eroded away. He's going to keep doing this. He's going to keep doing this. And so that's different. We didn't have that type of thing going on in previous market cycles in 2017 when all we had back then was hype and craze as everybody was rushing into the ICO, initial coin offerings, and hoping to make you know a, a bank, now, which was happening back then. I mean, people were throwing in $1,000 and walking away with 100000 and being like, sweet, I just bought a house or what have you. So definitely different. All right. Here we are. Another story that illustrates how adoption is happening around the world and in some of the unlikely places, but it's good stuff. Prepare for crypto says Tanzanian president to financial chiefs. Rock and roll. Tanzanian president Samia Saluhu Hassan said her country should prepare for the greater adoption of cryptocurrencies. In a speech in Mwanza on Sunday, President Saluhu told the country's financial chiefs to prepare for cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency. She also declared that the age of crypto and blockchain was dawning, using her country to lead by example. We have witnessed the emergence of a new journey through the internet, she stated. However, she also noted that many have not accepted or started using these routes. Signaling cryptocurrencies as the future of finance, she urged the central bank to start working on that development. Now, these remarks came on the heels of El Salvador adopting Bitcoin as legal tender, which we've talked about the last couple of days. Meanwhile, back in Africa, peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin trading volumes grew 50% year-on-year in May, totaling at over 17 million in volume. Over the past six months, most African nations have shown a 15-30% to 30 increase in Bitcoin trading volume. For reference, North America actually experienced an 18% drop in trading volume. However, while North America remains the most active, peer-to-peer -peer trading volume is growing the fastest in Africa. Wow, isn't that amazing? So this goes with what we've been talking about the last few days. Last week, we spent a lot of time on it. Countries around the world are starting to look, are starting to, be, are starting to become crypto advocates as they look to cryptocurrency to throw off the shackles. This is the best way that I can think to describe it. Exciting stuff. Exciting, exciting, exciting stuff. All right, another story. Crypto wallet app Ledger Live integrates its first DeFi platform, Paraswap. I'm not going to spend much time on this. Basically, the bottom line is Ledger, which is one of the most used hardware wallets, and they have their Ledger Live uh, app, are integrating Paraswap, which is an Ethereum-based decentralized exchange like Uniswap, SushiSwap, Balancer, and Curve. Basically, it's an aggregator that supports all of those. It supports Uniswap, SushiSwap, Balancer, and Curve. And so they've integrated this into the wallet, and they are going to integrate other DEXs from other chains as well. So that means we're going to, once we've got things rolling on Cardano, we've got Cardano-based DEXs, and we've got Polka, Polkadot base and all these sorts of things, and Solana base. And I would imagine even maybe one day there'll be an integration of my air on Elrond Gold and some of the others. Now, and this is cool stuff because this just makes everything. The reason I wanted to talk about this is because this illustrates the maturing from a technical standpoint of the of the market and of the space, of the cryptocurrency space. This makes it so much easier. I mean, you've already got your crypto in your wallet and you're going to be able to just hit connect from your ledger wallet and boom, you're right into DeFi. And you're trading, you're exchanging, you're buying, you're selling, you're staking, you're into the liquidity pools 
maybe even you know your 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 micro loan type of stuff that will be coming and happening with so many things that are going to open up so many doors and possibilities within the crypto space and it's just becoming more and more seamless which is what we need because we still have this thing going on big picture again of many people who are like oh that crypto stuff it's just too confusing for me and you know it's not it's actually much easier at the end of the day and it can be and will be to, to, to operate within crypto in terms of transactions and sending people money and things like this than it is in the legacy system, in the banking system, which is old and slow and obtuse and a pain in the butt, riddled by, you know, written. things that just slow everything down and make it more difficult, right? Well, crypto is not. That's why we see so many people, the younger people especially, and maybe it's not even just younger people, but using Venmo, right? Send money back and forth. And that's what's going to happen with crypto. It'll be that, and it is. It really, it is. It just, it needs to sort of be formalized and standardized and, you know, and just grow in usage. And then once people get introduced, they're like, well, that was, that was dang easy. So good things in that direction. All right. More signs of really great mass adoption here as billionaire investor. This is our next story. Billionaire investor Paul Tudor Jones wants to have 5% of his assets in Bitcoin. Billionaire investor Paul Duder Jones has said that he likes Bitcoin as a portfolio diversifier and wants to allocate 5% of his assets onto the cryptocurrency. This is what he said on Monday when talking to CNBC. He said, Bitcoin is math and math has been around for thousands of years and two plus two is going to equal four and it will for the next 2000 years. So I like the idea of investing in something that is reliable, consistent, honest, and 100% certain. Boom, boom, boom. Another one bites dust. Of course, Paul Tudor Jones came around, I don't know, six months ago, a year ago. I forget exactly when, but it was sort of a little bit of a slow transition. But he started to hint that he was becoming more favorable towards Bitcoin. And now he's actually come out saying 5% allocation. When asked if he likes Bitcoin at current prices, Tudor Jones, the founder, chairman, and CEO of Tudor Investment Corporation said, I know for sure I want to have 5% in gold, 5% in Bitcoin, 5% in cash, 5% in commodities. The rest 80% allocation would depend on what the U.S. Federal Reserve will do in its upcoming policy meeting this week, because what they do will have a big impact. Tudor Jones is already an investor in Bitcoin. Last year, he said he has almost 2% of his assets in the cryptocurrency. It is not clear whether the investor, whose net worth is around $7 billion, has increased his Bitcoin allocation since then. Yeah, I bet he bought this recent dip. Yep. Tudor Jones also expressed his concerns on Bitcoin's environmental impact in Monday's interview. He said, if I was king of the world, I'd ban Bitcoin mining just because of the environmental impact and make the ecosystem figure out a way to do it without expanding supply anymore at all. Yeah, interesting concept. You know, that, that, that could happen, but then you've got to have a way to do transactions, and then he doesn't understand the technical aspect of that. You have to have the miners in order to be able to send and receive Bitcoin. And this is why the future is proof of stake. Proof of stake. Proof of stake. Yes. Could Bitcoin go proof of stake? The answer to that question is yes, technically it could. Will it? It probably will not. So therefore it probably cannot. But you never know. If the community as a whole were able to push in that direction and the developers were to agree as well. The problem there though is it's super, 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 super difficult and risky. I mean, we see that happening with Ethereum right now. It, it's difficult. What is more likely to happen, in my view, is that one of the proof of stake currencies will eventually surpass Bitcoin. Sorry, I just made a bunch of people mad. Hey, it's just, I'm saying it can happen. I'm not saying I want it to. I'm not saying, I, should it, maybe it even should happen. Sorry, I, I can't, I love, I love Bitcoin. I love what it started. I love concept. But these maximalists are just, they've gone nuts. I mean, as a proponent of freedom and competition, and free market, I don't want one currency to rule. I don't, you know, 
Yeah. And I, I wouldn't care if there was a new leader and it flipped every every few months. Something else popped back up into the number one spot in terms of total value. I don't care. As long as it ha- they hold true to the fundamental core principles of cryptocurrency, which is the things that I believe it derives value from, which is an immutable ledger that is that has a limited supply that is, you know, less easy to trace and confiscate, providing freedom and n- not inflationary. All these things that help individuals build wealth and maintain wealth, that it's a good store of value, etc. Great. I don't care which one's number one. I don't care if there's 10. I don't care if, you know, I'd love to see the market, total market cap go to $100 trillion or more. But I don't care which one's number one. All right. On to the next story. Thai regulators ban exchanges from trading meme tokens and NFTs. <laughs> I thought this was interesting. Digital asset platforms can no longer trade meme based tokens non-fungible tokens, NFTs, and exchange-issued tokens in Thailand after the country's Security and Exchange Commission banned them on Friday, according to the Bangkok Post. The ban applies to tokens like Dogecoin, which was created as a joke, but has gained a lot of popularity in crypto space. It also includes NFTs, which are unique tokens that represent digital files like images and sound. And you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just come right out and say, I think they're going to reverse this eventually because it's just silly. But I wanted to bring this up because there's a couple points here that I want to pull out from this. Number one is I'm not in support of this. On the one hand, it's tempting to be in support of it because it's like, yeah, their job as regulators is to protect people from making stupid, unwise, risky investments, sort of. Not really. They're to protect people. This is not true. I, I got to dial that back. Got to dial that back. What they, That is not their job. Their job, now, of course, Obviously, this is we're not talking about U.S. regulators, so that's the U.S. regulator's job. But if they are bringing value, their value would be in shutting down scams and frauds. And, and, and some of these meme coins definitely fall into that category, and some of the NFTs would fall into that category as well. But it's to protect against rug pulls. It's to protect against projects that are Ponzi schemes, that are just taking from the new people coming in and distributing to the people below and it's a clear Ponzi scheme and we're not talking about an asset where the asset that you hold stores value and as more people come in yes it increases in value I mean there's an element of, of a Ponzi-ish type of thing in everything right even in the dollar I mean the fact that we uh, believe it has value gives it that value right so but some of these projects are set up in such a way that the people that enter in earlier so it's a Ponzi scheme in that Bitcoin is not a Ponzi scheme because everybody that holds it, once you hold it, receives the same increase in value. Right? Sure, you don't have as many coins, but if Bitcoin goes up 10%, you, you, you know, the price goes up, your holding goes up 10% as well. Where a Ponzi scheme, what happens is it's engineered in such a way that the people at the top constantly acquire a bigger and bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger, bigger percentage not in terms of value relative to the dollar, but actually in terms of the number of coins they hold of that particular project, right? And there's a lot that are out there like this. There's, you know, there's these systems where there's a transaction fee built in and it goes up in higher percentages to the people who came in early versus the people that come in later. That's a Ponzi scheme. So the early adopters are just built into the system. They, they don't earn, they, they don't become wealthier because they hold more and, it, and the, as the price goes up, they, 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 their value of their holdings goes up, they actually earn more as the supply gets funneled up to them, right? So that's a Ponzi scheme. So number one takeaway is I don't believe that regulators should be coming in and banning Dogecoin or banning NFTs. However, it would behoove exchanges to self-regulate in this way and just not list scammy type of projects. Now, Obviously, a lot of exchanges are like, well, we don't care. We just want to make the profits off of the transactions that are occurring. Because on exchange, every time somebody buys and sells and trades, the exchange makes money, right? So they're not really incentivized to do any kind of due diligence and make sure that the projects that are being listed are legitimate or that sort of thing. Some exchanges do, some exchanges don't. But 
it would behoove them if they would self-regulate in this way. Because if they don't, what's going to end up happening is a lot of people are going to get burned by these scam type of coins. And it's a it's a mar on the entire cryptocurrency space, but it also allows for regulators to come in then and start to strip away the freedoms and say, look, you can't list this and you can't list that. Now, one of the interesting things about DeFi is that you can't do any of this at all. Like Uniswap, for instance, on the Ethereum blockchain, anybody can create a coin on there. So when you go on there and you start buying or selling or trading, swapping tokens, you'll get warnings sometimes about that because people could even spoof and make it look like you're trading one coin when you're not and scam you that way. And so, you know, there's this catch 22 there where in a totally free market where you, you have in a DeFi type of situation where there's no regulation, there's no control, there's really no way to do that. People are likely to get scammed. And then it, then it becomes what is ultimately the best way to go about these things, I believe, and that is through education. But you're always going to have stupid people that are not willing to be educated, that are not willing to listen, and they're going to go out and they want to play that super high-risk game. And, and that becomes gambling. And hey, you know what? Fine. I'm okay with that too. But if exchanges don't want to be regulated, they need to self-regulate, right? And they need to at least, if they do have your meme type tokens or your nfts that could be super risk or whatever it is educate the users right so you could totally do that before you they go and they trade here look understand this is the way this works and here's what you need to understand this is the risk that you're taking you want to continue to go ahead go ahead that's the way i think it should work all right enough on that this is an interesting story or article some analysis about what's going on with grayscale Moving on to our last segment, Bitcoin sell pressure may hit zero in July thanks to Grayscale's giant 16K BTC unlocking. The biggest single unlocking day will flush sellers from the market in July, opening up both volatility and bullish potential. So what happens with Grayscale is that when people buy GBTC, they're they're locked in for a certain period of time. They can't sell. And then there are these unlockings that occur at intervals. And we've got one coming up. And it's one of the biggest ever. It's 16,000 Bitcoin that's going to be unlocked, which means that the holders could potentially dump that and sell that, which obviously would have a negative, potentially negative, impact on the price. But this analyst, Bloomdart, is saying that, hey, look, once that happens, after that's done and that's sold, according to his analysis, there's zero spot BTC to sellers left, right? So the idea is this. This would form a refreshing counterpoint to the broadly bearish picture on the institutional markets with open interest in Bitcoin futures way down versus prior to the May price dip to 30,000. On-chain analytics resource CryptoQuant noted the decline in interest last week, something which in turn came in tandem with a dramatic decline in overall BTC transaction numbers. So yeah, this, this remains to be seen. What impact this is going to have, this uh, unlocking on July 19th of the 16,000 Bitcoin, which is equivalent to 627 million, that will be released. But, you know, and it could be that that uh, very little of that actually gets sold on the spot market, thereby not really affecting the price much at all. But it is something that is interesting to look at. And that some predictions can be made based off of off the analytics there. But as I was saying earlier, this this space, it's just I'll tell you what, if there's anything that's gonna gonna <laughs> that the that the current market will uh, will demonstrate is that. Bitcoin is like this completely irrational, emotionally driven, illogical <laughs> market where you never know what to expect. You just can't. Other than the fact that ultimately over the long run, as a deflationary asset with a, with a space that continues to grow in terms of use and adoption, if you hold you will do well. That is another axiom that I am absolutely, absolutely 100% convinced of. Okay, friends, thank you so much for your time. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Block Dasher Daily Crypto Update. I hope you have a phenomenal week. Here we go. We're starting the net. We're mid-June. 
It's going to be hot out there, a lot of fun summer activity. I hope you enjoy a lot of that with your friends and family. And uh, continue to come back every day for a uh, market update. Love and appreciate you all. Talk to you soon. See you tomorrow.